written by Lee Hansen, Jim Cook, and Ron Thompson. Our stars included Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guest stars Clark Warren, Larry Moss, Herb Ellis, Joe Young, and Helen Funai. Associate producer, Ron Thompson. Music director, Tom Rounds. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Assistant to the producer, Jim Cook. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen. And so until next week, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for our next adventure, Earthlight on Alien Worlds. This is Lee Hansen. The next two episodes of Alien Worlds will not involve Star Lab or our friends in the ISA. We're going to take you on a mystical journey through a science fiction fantasy adventure that explores the intergalactic origins of spiritual evil and how the inhabitants of the ancient planet of Alithia set out to neutralize that evil over 2,000 years ago. Here then are Olin Soule, Lorraine Tuttle, Rusi Taylor, and Roger Dressler in part one of our special presentation, Earthlight. Something silent fractures the Alithian midnight clouds, and they slowly puzzle apart, releasing the ghostly radiances of three white moons. Brilliant lunar light shimmers down onto Alithia's night side. Darkness dissolves as far north as the ion refineries at Lahelia, as far south as the Aviara Sun Tower complex, as far east as the Lusa Canal intersect, as far west as the domed wingship port at Darmus. Huge cloud fragments break away and drift past the moons. There is a sudden eclipse of light. Then the cloud fragments narrow to smoky splinters, curl up into the fluorescent winds of the aurora sphere and vanish. The moonlight returns intensifies, expands. It sweeps across the starflight complex at Kalava, illuminates the celestial laboratories at Somari, seeps down into the Penumbrian shadow forest, and brightens the pyramid of Deus, which rests at the forest's perimeter. A canal of dark water flows between the pyramid and the forest, Iridescent nova blossoms on the canal bottom sense the moonlight and rise to the surface, their translucent petals shimmering with color. Docked at the edge of the canal is a slender Elithian wind ship, its triangular sails folded, its 30-foot long transparent metal hull low in the water. The huge main chamber inside the pyramid is illuminated by the pale yellow flames of a hundred thick white candles. Moonlight streams in through the stained glass sky windows at the chamber's peak. Delicately woven tapestries and intricate mosaics decorate the angled walls. Beneath the sky windows sits Deus, the father, Elithia's most highly evolved divine scientist. On the carved wooden table in front of him is an ancient voice book, its pages embossed with complex hieroglyphs. As he moves his fingertips over the hieroglyphs, the book voice tells him the future, reaffirming his dream about another expedition to the planet of Terra Lu. A beautiful woman is blinded by visions of immortality. 
and falls to sleep in a flower field. A star machine floats down into the scented void of summer. A child is born. A healer of spirits walks across the deep currents of the faraway sea. The suffering are comforted. The dying are healed. The dead are reborn. The healer of spirits ascends to the stars. Terra Lou sinks below the fiery horizons of an alien sun. Faces look up. The sky stands still. Terra Lou. So many expeditions. So little progress. So many of our sons and daughters lost. A thousand years, and it's just beginning. Deus? Ah, oh, come in and sit with me, Sabella. Have you seen the sky, Deus? The clouds are gone and the moons are out. It's a perfect night for star flying. Mm hmm The book said it would be. Has the book reaffirmed that we are returning to the Veda sector of Terra Lu? Yes, and it told me about the woman. Her name is Aram. She's young and strong and beautiful. And she's never known the Darkbringer virus. Elisha Bai had never known the virus either. Do they share the same blood? Yes. And because they do, the embryon child implanted in Elisha Bai during the last expedition and the embryon child of this expedition will share the times to come. <laughs> the times to come. How are things progressing at Kalava? The ship was moved to Dome 3 at sunset for fueling and ancillary pre-flight maintenance. Has Aram's embryon child been taken aboard? Yes. Lyria took him into the ship's nucleus chamber at moonrise. She's holding him in the secondary genesis tank while Karmas finishes refocusing the convection lenses on the primary. And what about Zuriel? Has he installed the new Paratron refractor? He's still working on it. He would have finished by now, but there was a technical setback. Oh? When Zuriel examined the new refractor, he found that two of the waveform links were flawed. There wasn't time to send it back to Suma Ray, so he's correcting the flaw with a series of Nimbus filters. Nimbus filters? I wasn't aware that such things existed. They didn't until now. Zuriel synthesized them in the Spectrum Laboratory in Dome 6. <laughs> Is this the beginning of a new era in Alithian technology? <laughs> well, Zuriel seems to think so. You know how he is when he does something especially inventive. Yes. Yes, I know. Deus. Hmm? When Aram's embryon child evolves to his final form and begins his work, will he be alone? He will at first. But eventually there will be a multitude. How will it end? Tears, blood, a heart pierced with metal. And what will become of us? Will we return to Alethea? The book didn't know, Sibella, where the journey back should have been. There was only silence. Deus, was the book able to calculate the time lapse between our departure from Alithia tonight and our penetration of Terra Lu's gravity veil? Yes. Eleven solar days, nine phenomenas. When will we make contact with Aram? Three phenomenas past sunrise on the morning of the twelfth day. She'll be alone in a field near her village, gathering red and white flowers. Red and white. Blood and purity. Yes. The two elements that will haunt Aram to the end of her days. Well, it's getting late, Sibella. We'd better start for Kalava. As Deus and Sibella walk down the luminescent gemstone path leading to the canal, a swarm of fluorescent blue spider moths stream out of the shadow forest, circle the canal's reflection of Alithia's three moons, and streak away into the flower-scented night. Sibella and Deus board Sibella's windshield, move to the deep circular cockpit just behind the bow, and settle into thickly cushioned contour seats. 
Between the two seats is a narrow, transparent black systems console, its surface glittering with multiple rows of brightly colored control prisms. Sibella touches three of them, interfacing the wingship's guidance system with a central canal link encoder at Darmus. The huge domed wingship port, which lies 75 demivectors south of the pyramid. Your request for automatic guidance parameters has been received, Sabella. Your vessel will proceed from the Avatar Pyramid tributary through the Lusaw Canal intersect to the Taniel Embrya tributary arch. Automatic guidance will be terminated and manual control returned as you pass beneath the arch and approach the Kalava subcanal. Tiny levers fold open in the windship's thin metal masts, releasing a quiet, magnetically generated wind which swells the translucent yellow sails. The small, graceful ship drifts out into the center of the canal, turns 45 degrees, and moves forward to the clean, clear water, nova blossom particles flaring in its wake. Deus, what is calorescent spectrocyte? I overheard Zuriel mention it to Karmas. Spectrocyte was the liquid light fuel that powered our first starships. We terminated its use long before you were born. Why? Wasn't it efficient? Yes, it was the perfect experimental fuel, Sabella. Efficient, highly unstable, and extremely dangerous. During the third expedition, we killed 9,000 inhabitants of Terra Lu with it. 9,000? Deus, what happened? An accident. A circuit malfunction caused a fuel bay hatch to open, and an armed spectrocyte fuel pod was ejected. The pod exploded on impact between two wilderness cities that stood near the shore of a dying inland sea. When Karmus and Lyria went down in a lander to look for survivors, all they found was a young female in the nearby hills. Was she alive? No. Spectrocyte radiation had transformed her into a pillar of white ionic stone. She stood like a statue, looking back at where the two cities had been. The perimeter of the shadow forest slowly fades into the night as the wind ship leaves the Avatar Pyramid tributary and sails out into the Lusar Canal intersect, the vast artificial lagoon where all of Elithia's equatorial waterways converge. Deus settles back in his seat, looks up at the three moons through half-closed eyes, and slowly wills himself into a memory trance. A chill surges through his body. The nuclei of his secondary blood cells divide, releasing the organically stored experiences of another time. Then a bright rushing sound only he can hear takes his mind 1,000 years into the past. Sunlight and the warm winds touch his face. He glides over the sea of echoes in a small windship. In the bright, pale green distance is Reviva Island. On it stands the great white dome of Elithia's Exobionic Observatory. The observatory has been receiving and analyzing scan tracings from two drone flyers which are exploring the void of the nine worlds in the far galaxy of Sirisius. Both flyers have discovered something unexpected and ominous. Diabas, the observatory matriarch, is concerned. Have you confirmed it, Diavis? Yes. Sit here beside me, Deus. I'll transfer the visual data to the wall screen. An abstract three-dimensional scan pattern fluoresces onto the large triangular wall monitor and slowly becomes a geological image of multi-layered earth and volcanic rock. 
Embedded in one of the lairs are the mummified bodies of three nude humanoid women. Next to them are five black skeletons whose grotesque skulls resemble the heads of ebony gargoyles. Each skeleton lies against a secondary pattern of thin black bones, the bones of what were once large, bat-like wings. Another world contaminated by Darkbringers. Is it a planet in this star system? No. It's in the Cerithius galaxy. Terra Lu, the only inhabited planet in the void of the nine worlds. Drone flyer Septus began transmitting these substrata images seven days ago. Was it a full-scale invasion? No. It was confined to a relatively small area near Terra Lu's equatorial meridian. When did it happen? Nineteen light eons ago, just as Terra Lu was entering its third neuroevolution. They lived in caves, Andeos and ate the flesh of things that crawled and flew. How large was the attack force? One Darkbringer Legion, probably an inquest unit. They invaded the cave settlement, killed the males and children, and then attacked the females. The same assault method they used here, and on Anianus and Telluria. Why didn't the assault extend beyond that one area? The region was destroyed during the attack by a first magnitude strata convulsion, and volcanic eruptions. An enormous chasm reached open, and the entire settlement collapsed into it. The Darkbringer Armada was probably in an observation orbit during the assault, but when they saw the instantaneous destruction of an entire legion, I think they became frightened and moved out into deep space. Yes, you're probably right. They always did become blind with confusion in the presence of unexpected planetary convulsions. Have the reproductive organs of the dead females been analyzed? Drone flyer Erebus transmitted its scanner analysis last night. The bodies of all three females contain traces of calcified Darkbringer insemination fluid. Have you received a retrospective survival projection? Yes. According to the residual biotime scan from drone Erebus, there were over 800 female survivors all of them inseminated during the assault. None of their newborns had any physical Darkbringer characteristics, but they all emerged from their parent mothers, saturated with the Darkbringer anti-light virus. Has the virus evolved with them? This morning, from an orbital distance of 300 demovectors, Drone Septus Hemo scanned the entire population of Terra Lu. It saw the virus in the blood and bone marrow of every male and female, regardless of tribe or age. And has the virus affected them in the same way it affected us? There are variations, even some resistance at first. But in time, the virus flourishes and the inner light grows dark. Without any evolutionary interference from us, how much longer will the virus control Terra Lou? A minimum of 500 centuries. By the end of that time, the entire Cerisius galaxy would be contaminated. There's only one choice, isn't there? Yes, an expedition. We know the inner light can be resurrected through induced evolution meditations. We've proved that here. We've proved it on Anianus and Teluria. Diavis, do you see any reason why our spirit magicians couldn't teach the meditations on Terra Lou? I see two reasons. The anti-light disease wasn't as advanced on those planets. And where Anianus and Telluria were both entering an age of radiance, when the invasions came, Terra Lu is still hyper-primitive and superstitious. It would be impossible to land ships there without terrifying. Our teachers will have to come to Terra Lu from within, not from without. Embryons? Yes. Created from your blood and implanted in their female. It would take time. It would be difficult. It would be dangerous. But in the end, the virus would be neutralized. The light would be resurrected. And Terra Lou would no longer be divided against itself. Terra Lou. Terra Lou. So many.
many expeditions. It would take time. So little progress. It would be difficult. So many of our sons and daughters lost. It would be dangerous. A thousand years. But in the end, the virus would be neutralized. The light would be resurrected. And Terra Lou would no longer be divided against itself. I was just remembering an old friend and a hundred other nights like this and a hundred other expeditions. So much time has passed. So many of Alithia's sons and daughters have been lost. A thousand years. And it's just beginning. What did you do after the Darkbringers killed your parent, mother, and father? I escaped into the wilderness of Bas with a group of scientists and technical magicians from the city of Tia Lin. We thought we'd be safe there. But three days after the initial attack, Darkbringer annihilation squads began saturating the atmosphere and waterways with the virus. Eventually, we all became infected to some degree. The effects of the anti-light disease have never been described to me, Deus. What actually happens? begins with an underlying discontent with the ceremonies and celebrations of life. Intelligence is corrupted. Emotion displaces logic. Imagination ceases to evolve. The ability to separate the symbols of existence from existence itself disappears. And so does the belief that all life is sacred. The effects are irresistible and inescapable, even in the unconscious sanctuaries of sleep. How long were you in the wilderness? Twenty-five years. Do you know the story of Vershila? Oh, some, but not all of it. Vershila was a mantric high priest who came to us in the wilderness during our 25th year of exile. He told us he had cured himself of the anti-light disease through a series of induced evolution meditations. He had discovered the meditations in the Persana Utvalya Jewel the ancient Alithian poem of creation. He taught us the meditations, and we healed ourselves. Then we went out from the wilderness and secretly taught the meditations throughout Alithia. And the revolution against the dark bringers began 50 years after that? Yes. Our technical magicians built secret subterranean laboratories where they created ships armed with powerful liquid light injectors. One year after our ships rose up against them, the dark bringers abandoned Alithia, and the age of radiance began. As the wind ship approaches the Tanil Imbria tributary arch, it passes a Sun Tower complex construction site on the lagoon's northern shore. Polished metal, saucer-shaped hover drones lower huge white Sun Tower obelisks onto thick pads of fluorescent synergite. Giant constructor tripods stand in front of the huge synergite blocks, their long, flexible arms coiled around the 400-foot-tall sun towers, guiding them into place. The complex is surrounded by multifaceted solar energy domes and power dispersion pyramids made of thick, white crystal. Did you see Shiva today? Yes, we walked in the forest this morning. How does she feel about the new Sun Tower complex? It looks as though it's nearly finished. She's delighted with its progress. The iron refineries at Lahilia and the floral hatcheries at Vianatet are already drawing power from it. She estimates it'll be fully operational in another six days. We'll be halfway to Terra Lou in six days. Sibella, are you concerned that the book didn't know if we'd be coming back? What will become of us, Deus? if the ship should fall into a star. The prospect of death doesn't disturb you, does it? No. No, I thought not. Then, what does? Rebirth. Have you ever imagined 
what it would be like to be reborn on some other planet, one that wouldn't care about our secrets or understand our ecstasies or forgive our failures? There's no such planet, Sabella. Not in this universe. Inside his pyramid on the ancient planet of Alithia, Deus, Alithia's patriarch, listens as the voice of a sacred dream book reaffirms his sleep visions of another expedition to the planet of Terra Lu. A beautiful woman is blinded by visions of immortality and falls to sleep in a flower field. A star machine floats down into the scented voids of summer. A child is born. A healer of spirits walks across the deep currents of the faraway sea. The suffering are comforted. The dying are healed. The dead are reborn. The healer of spirits ascends to the stars. Terra Lou sinks below the fiery horizons of an alien sun. Faces look up. The sky stands still. Terra Lou. So many expeditions. So little progress. So many of our sons and daughters lost. A thousand years, and it's just beginning. Deus? Ah, oh, come in and sit with me, Sabella. Has the book reaffirmed that we're returning to the Veda sector of Terra Lu? Yes, and it told me about the woman. Her name is Aram. She's young and strong and beautiful. And she's never known the Darkbringer virus. Elisha Ba had never known the virus either. Do they share the same blood? Yes. And because they do, the embryon child implanted in Elisha Ba during the last expedition and the embryon child of this expedition will share the times to come. How are things progressing at Kalava? The ship was moved to Dome 3 at sunset for fueling and ancillary pre-flight maintenance. Has Aram's embryon child been taken aboard? Yes. Lyria took him into the ship's nucleus chamber at moonrise. How will it end? Tears. Blood. A heart pierced with metal. And what will become of us? Will we return to Alithia? The book didn't know, Sabella where the journey back should have been, there was only silence. Well, it's getting late, Sibella. We'd better start for Kalava. At the edge of the wide canal that flows past the pyramid, Deus and Sibella board a slender, transparent metal windship and settle into the deep cockpit behind the bow. Touching three small fluorescent prisms on the control console, Sabella interfaces the windship's guidance system with Alithia's central canal link encoder. Your request for automatic guidance parameters has been received, Sabella. Your vessel will proceed from the Avatar Pyramid tributary through the Luthal Canal intersect to the Taniel Embryo tributary arch. Automatic guidance will be terminated and manual control returned as you pass beneath the arch and approach the Kalava subcanal. Half an hour later, the wind ship sails out into the Lusa Canal intersect, the vast artificial lagoon where all of Elithia's equatorial waterways converge. Deus settles back in his seat, looks up at Elithia's three moons, and slowly wills himself into a memory trance that takes his mind 1,000 years into the past. Two Elithian drone flyers have been orbiting Terra Lu, the only inhabited planet in the void of the nine worlds. During their 13th orbit, the two laboratory drones have discovered something unexpected and ominous. Deus is called to Elithia's Exobionic Observatory, where scanner data from the two flyers is being decoded and analyzed. Have you confirmed it, Diavis? Yes. Sit here beside me, Dale. I'll transfer the visual data to the wall screen. 
A geological image of multi-layered earth and volcanic rock fluoresces under the large triangular wall monitor. Embedded in one of the layers are the mummified bodies of three nude humanoid women and the remains of five long black skeletons. Each skeleton lies against a secondary pattern of thin black bones, the bones of what were once large, bat-like wings. The skulls resemble the heads of ebony gargoyles. Another world contaminated by dark brain. When did it happen? Nineteen light eons ago, just as Taralu was entering his third neuroevolution. They lived in caves, Andales, and ate the flesh of things that crawled and flew. How large was the attack force? One Darkbringer Legion, probably an inquest unit. They invaded the cave settlement, killed the males and children, and then attacked the females. Why didn't the assault extend beyond that one area? The region was destroyed during the attack by a first magnitude strata convulsion and volcanic eruptions. Have the reproductive organs of the dead females been analyzed? Drone flyer Erebus transmitted its scanner analysis last night. The bodies of all three females contain traces of calcified darkbringer insemination fluid. Have you received a retrospective survival projection? There were over 800 female survivors all of them inseminated during the assault. None of their newborns had any physical Darkbringer characteristics, but they all emerged from their parent mothers, saturated with the Darkbringer anti-light virus. Has the virus evolved with them? This morning, from an orbital distance of 300 demovectors, Drone Septus Hemo scanned the entire population of Terralu. It saw the virus in the blood and bone marrow of every male and female, regardless of tribe or age. And has the virus affected them in the same way it affected us? There are variations, even some resistance at first. But in time, the virus flourishes and the inner light grows dark. There's only one choice, isn't there? Yes, an expedition. We know the inner light can be resurrected through induced evolution meditations. We proved that here. We've proved it on any Giannis and Teluria. Diabas, do you see any reason why our spirit magicians couldn't teach the meditations on Terra Lou? I see two reasons. The Anilite disease wasn't as advanced on those planets. And where Anianus and Teluria were both entering an age of radiance, when the invasions came, Terra Lou is still hyper-primitive and superstitious. It would be impossible to land ships there without terrifying. Our teachers will have to come to Terra Lou from within, not from without. Embryons? Yes. Created from your blood and implanted in their females. It would take time. It would be difficult. It would be dangerous. But in the end, the virus would be neutralized. The light would be resurrected. And Terra Lou would no longer be divided against. Ah, Sibella. I was just remembering an old friend and a hundred other nights like this and a hundred other expeditions. A thousand years. And it's just beginning. Deus, was the book able to calculate the time lapse between our departure from Elithia tonight and our penetration of Terra Lou's gravity veil? Yes. Eleven solar days, nine phenomenas. When will we make contact with Aram? Three phenomenas past sunrise on the morning of the twelfth day. She'll be alone in a field near a village, gathering red and white flowers. Red and white. Blood and purity. Yes. The two elements that will haunt Aram to the end of her days. Deus, Sabella, you are now approaching the Taniel Embria tributary arch. As you pass beneath it, 
Automatic guidance will be terminated, and manual control of your windship will be returned. May the spirits of the Twelve Lords of Light be with you on your journey to Terra Lou. As the canal link override terminates, Sibella touches a control prism, which activates a triple row of bright rectangular lights in the bow. Then she steers the windship through the wide Tenil Imbria tributary and enters the narrow Kalava sub-canal. A few moments later, the slim, transparent vessel glides across a small lagoon and docks at the edge of the Kalava Starflight Complex. complex is a vast, circular plain, flawlessly paved with interlocking triangles of white gemstone and red fire crystal. Hundreds of hexagon-shaped lamps free float around the perimeter, focusing brilliant light on six enormous copper-colored domes, a triple row of sun towers, and a primary launch arena. At the Calava dock, Deus and Sabella secure their windship and board a small hover drone which takes them across the gemstone and fire crystal plain to Dome 3. Inside the dome's airlock, Deus and Sabella remove their long dark cloaks and fold them into a small compartment in the wall. Later, they enter the dome's asepsis chamber and close their eyes and stand motionless as antiseptic light and sound sterilize their hair, skin, and outer garments. Then, a large circular hatch irises open in front of them and they step through into the dazzling light of the dome's interior. In the center of the dome is Alithia's most powerful and complex starship, a huge overloid spacecraft created from organically grown metals. It rests heavily on three massive pneumatic parking spheres and dwarfs the 50 technicians who move over its seamless polished metal surface. Parked in front of the starship are three teardrop-shaped tug crawlers. Their transparent canopies slid open. Six technicians string thin metal cables between the rear of the crawlers and towing rings on the ship. What do the inhabitants of Terralu think happens to them after death? They believe that if they live lives of kindness and affection, their dream selves transmigrate to the serenities of Empyrea. And if they live negative lives? Then their dream selves transmigrate to the fires of Stygia. But those regions were destroyed during the subvoid annihilation. The Darkbringer Archipelago had its genesis in the fires of Stygia long before the annihilations. But as life was evolving on its surface, the archipelago left its orbit and passed through Empyria. And in this passing, Empyria's light began to destroy the Darkbringer primitives. But they survived and continued to evolve under the delusion that physical and spiritual light were their deadliest enemies. In the center of the starship's nucleus chamber, the primary genesis tank floats one meter above the floor. Inside the transparent egg-shaped tank, suspended in a shimmering mist of chill vapor, is the tiny embryon child. He floats on his side, delicate fingers curled against his face, eyes closed, dreaming of the warmly scented summer voices that lie ahead, and the beautiful woman who will end the chemical winter in which he sleeps. Just look at him, Sibella. He's beautiful. He takes after his father, Deus. Lyria, is 12 solar days still the maximum span he'll be safe in cryosleep? 
I was able to extend it to 15 days by altering the inversion factor of the chill vapor crystal. Uh -huh. But 15 is the zero time maximum. Any longer, and the altered crystals will begin to neutralize his cellular divinity. Zurio, have you calculated our time to Terra Lou's gravity veil? Eleven solar days, nine phenomenas. Is that an absolute calculation? Absolutely. Why are you so amused, Deus? Eleven solar days, nine phenomenas is precisely what the book said. It also said we're returning to the Vita sector for an encounter with a beautiful young woman named Aram. Suriel, have you synthesized a copy of the book? I don't synthesize books, Sabella. I only synthesize Nimbus filters. <laughs> so I've heard. Zuriel, how did you know about Aram in the Vita sector? Aram's neuropulse is the only one in the bio-index terminal free of viral contamination. When I scanned the pulse, I found a first magnitude Vita sector imprint. It seems you've finally become as wise as the book, Suriel. Suriel, are we coming back from this expedition? I don't know. You're right, Lyria. He has become as wise as the book. He didn't know either. <laughs> <laughs> Deus, may I see you for a moment? Yes, Carmus. Where are you? I'm in the system's index chamber. Zuriel, you and Sabella go into the guidance chamber and begin the pre-launch procedures. Lyria, we'll have our usual talk after void entry. Is there a technical problem, Thomas? No. Problem isn't technical, although technology was involved. I don't understand. I know we're returning to the Vita sector of Terra Lou, and I know the woman's name is Aram. Mm. Zuriel? No, I... I knew before Zuriel did. I was so curious to know where we were going that I got carried away and synthesized a copy of the book last night. <sighs> Karmas. Yes, Deus? Is nothing sacred. <laughs> Inside the dome, the three tug crawlers inch forward, tightening the thin towing cables that connect them to the ship. A huge section of the dome wall slides open. The tug crawlers move through the opening toward the brightly lit launch arena. Behind them, the giant starship rolls forward on its massive parking spheres. In the guidance chamber, Deus, Sibella, and Zuriel sit in cushioned pod chairs, facing a massive instrument console. Its dark metal surface, alive with control prisms, regulator diodes, sequencer jewels, interface crystals, and iridescent decoder keys. Start the pre-emanation cycle on the artificial gravity radiator, Sibella. Interior gravity is stable at E.3. Grav factor links are sequenced to convert to E.9 during corridor penetration and E.12.1 at void entry. Deus, an ion storm is forming in the penetration corridor over Illyria. Karmas, we need a revised launch velocity. Just a moment. A launch velocity of KPS.660 will take us through the storm before its primary spectrum collision phase. KPS.660. Sibella, engage the exterior hyperlight coils when we launch. Ion storms are too unpredictable not to take precautions. Yes, Deus. The ship is in position, Deus, and the towing vehicles have cleared the launch arena. Engage the ancillary pulse drive reactor, Sibella. Reactor engagement confirmed. Solar power matrix is stable at multiple sublinks 8, 18, and 80. All ship register encoders, guidance optics, and inverter grids are hyperlinked and scanning. Release the parking spheres, Sibella. A hexagon-shaped hatch irises open in the bottom of the ship, and a huge gleaming tripod slowly telescopes down. 
thick metal flex shock pads unfold from the tip of each tripod leg and press against the launch arena's white gemstone floor. The ship raises slightly, releasing the parking spheres which slowly roll away into the anchoring depressions at the arena's perimeter. Pod chair emergency ejection hatches are armed. Pod chair floater cone nozzles are in phase. REM scale time to launch is Tricon 0.3.1. Retract the tripod, Zoriel. The bright metal tripod withdraws into the ultraviolet glow of its storage bay, leaving the huge Olympian starship suspended 25 meters above the arena. Nine round ports iris open around the concealed tripod hatch releasing thin beams of dazzling white light. Lubrid exhaust vents blast raw magnetic waste against the arena floor, raising a translucent wave of fine white dust which rolls out over the anchored parking spheres. Rim scale time is terminated. Primary reactor interlock at binary 2.3.1. huge spacecraft slowly rotates 90 degrees and begins its majestic ascent. At an altitude of 30 demovectors, the ship is a tiny overloid shadow and nine pinpoints of light. Demovectors, the starship banks 18 degrees, angles up, and races toward the penetration corridor over Illyria. Suddenly, a section of the corridor ceiling tears away and a sucking vacuum of ionized winds lash out, trying desperately to draw the ship up into its crushing vortex. Then, as suddenly as it began, the crisis is over, and the ship accelerates out through Elithia's shimmering aurora sphere into the starlit serenity of deep space. Is our embryon child safe, Lyria? Yes, dear. Safe and sleeping. Have you decided what his name will be? His name is the word the ancient thought magicians used to describe the power of the inner self. The word is Jesus, and it means I am become the healer of worlds. Thompson, and starred Olin Soule as Deus, Lucy Taylor as Sibella, Mel Wells as Carmus, Byron Kane as Zuriel, Susan Silo as Lyria, and Loreen Tuttle as Diabas. Associate producer, Ron Thompson. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Music director, Tom Rounds. Assistant to the producer, Jim Cook. Technical consultant, Peter Skye. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen. And so, until next week, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for our next adventure, The Seeds of Time, from the elsewhere and elsewhen of Alien.